without further ado, I'll go ahead and mute myself and pass the mic over to Dr. Jason Farmer. All right. Uh, good to meet all of you virtually here. Thanks for taking the time uh, this evening to hear about DCC uh, and chat with our students and, and chat with me a bit about the program. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen so you can um, see a little bit of this. Oh, let me adjust this for a moment. All right. Okay. So DCC has this very broad and nebulous name, uh, design, cultures, and creativity, three terms that I think are just... Um, yeah, they could kind of mean anything. Uh, you know, are we a fashion design program, graphic design? Are we engineering design? Uh, cultures and creativity are similarly broad terms. Um, and one of the fantastic things about having a name that's so broad is actually we can embrace uh, the various ways that these terms are defined. Uh, and one of the things that ultimately happens because of the breadth of these terms is that you have people from all across campus from 47 different majors with a broad range of backgrounds come together in this really interdisciplinary community um, to study uh, a wide range of things. So the essence of DCC is that we are a uh, we foster an open, collaborative, and social environment, uh, and we encourage students to explore the relationship between design, uh, design social context, and creative practices. So um, the other component of this is that we are makers and thinkers, um, and so we think of making is a mode of thinking. By doing something in a hands-on way, you get to ask questions that could not have been asked otherwise. By hands-on exploration, you get to ask new questions about something in ways that could not have been unlocked otherwise. So making is a method for how we understand um, different kinds of issues that we are facing as a society. And we're passionate about emerging technologies. We're passionate about how we can make a positive impact on the world and ultimately how we can really design the world to be a better place. That's, that's one of the core things that we're really interested in. How can our design intercede? How can design make a difference? Uh, how can we build a world that's more equitable, uh, more socially just, uh, that addresses some of the major problems and uh, concerns that we're facing at this moment? Um, but in order to actually even answer those questions, to approach the major challenges that we as a society are facing, you have to bring together people uh, with different skill sets um, and put them in the same room. It's different than your major. I instead, it's about bringing people from all across campus into one building to collaborate. You bring together people with different backgrounds. You need to see things from different perspectives. You need to have people challenge your approaches and, and your assumptions about things. And that requires bringing together people from different uh, backgrounds and different perspectives that can really um, give you a new vision on the way that the world is shaped uh, and some of the ways that these uh, challenges we're facing address different people in different kinds of ways. Um, so we are a living and learning program, which means uh, everyone lives in the same dorm together, um, even though they come from all different majors across campus. And so ultimately what we're doing is creating the con conditions for collaboration that really don't exist um, in this sort of capacity anywhere else in the nation. The living learning programs here at the University of Maryland, uh, DCC in particular, uh, are just this very diverse community uh, of people that will allow um, those who come into the hallways of Prince Frederick Hall to find these new inventive modes of collaboration uh, that you just don't find uh, anywhere else, ultimately. Um, when you come and study with us, you take a, a core set of classes with us. Uh, these fulfill gen ed requirements. One of the first is a class that uh, I teach, which is a large lecture where all the freshmen are in the same room together. Uh, it's HDCC 105. And um, one of the students told me, you know, during the online session, actually, if you had told me what we went over in 105, that would just give me a, a much clearer, more concrete sense of what DCC is like. Uh, so I wanted to give you a sense of what we do in 105 uh, when you join us in the fall. Uh, 105 is really, again, grounded on this idea that 
when we're exploring ideas, we explore them through hands-on creation. So it's a really project-driven course um, where we're pairing ideas with hands-on exploration. Uh, the course is broken down into three sections where we go into the three uh, terms in our name. Design is the first section. And when we uh, head into the design section of the class, uh, we begin by looking at graphic design. Uh, we begin with design principles. Uh, and what we ultimately want to do with this is to be able to say a bunch of things that you learn through graphic design and design principles actually apply so much more broadly than just in graphic design. You know, issues of uh, balance, asymmetry, um, issues of scale, um, and all of these issues that we're, we're teaching within the graphic design section then ultimately echo out into all the work that we do. Uh, so students design posters that show off their definition of design. As a student, how do you define design? These are some from the, the last year's cohort here that just um, the MU class that uh, just designed these in the fall. Um, just really great work. Um, and a big chunk of students just never had touched Photoshop or had done any kind of graphic design work before. Uh, we make the assumption that you've just never worked with this kind of stuff before. You don't have to come in with the skill set. Uh, we start from sort of the, the very foundations of working in Photoshop and in graphic design. Um, and then we build out from there to say design is all around us everything is designed. All human interactions in some capacity are designed. Uh, that design is not always visible. In fact, it's often hidden from view. And the consequences of it being hidden from view are really profound. Uh, when you think about the fact that as you encounter the world, design is often meant to be hidden. It's meant to sort of recede into the background of your uh, cognitive experience of the world. Um, and the ramifications are deep. Um, it, from just bad design, why are things so poorly designed as we interact with them, to issues of equity and social justice. Um, who is the world designed for? Um, you know, thinking about issues of gender and design, for example, uh, and we de delve into issues around uh, design and race as well. One of the things that students will do is they will take a design that's out there in everyday life and redesign it. Um, the first project that we did around this was uh, for students to go over to the DC Metro here, which is one of the worst design systems that we have in the area and redesign it. Um, students then um, have since taken apps or interactions or designs for the future and coded them through Adobe XD, which is a prototyping app that we do. Um, this is Bryant's uh, group's design here. Uh, they designed a dating app for uh, the the age of COVID here. You know, in, in our current context, how do you build a dating app? Um, and it was just really beautifully done uh, project here. Um, so they take an interaction, like trying to schedule a date uh, with your partner. Where are you going to go? You're also busy. How do you do this? And we have students redesign interactions and code them through prototypes and actually work with people one on one. We really advocate when it comes to design. First, you need to see it. You need to uncover it. You need to find out where it is. You need to understand its social context, um, where it's situated within culture. When you're designing something, you actually have to work with people. You have to design with, not for. Uh, so that's a big thing that we really emphasize in the program. Work with people. You have to interact with your communities that you're designing for. Uh, so that's a big part of this project is doing field work, um, doing usability testing, and understanding how people interact with your designs uh, out into the world. Um, we head into the culture section after this to begin to think about how design interacts with our identities, our histories, our cultures, our subcultures, who we are as people. Um, and we talk about how can design intercede in the challenges faced by our communities, um, by those who are within our culture. How can design um, make a difference? How can it actually move things forward? Uh, so we'll talk about things like algorithmic bias and racism, how um, algorithms perpetuate racial stereotypes and what we can do to begin to counteract 
um, some of the algorithmic bias that's emerging. Uh, students will delve into issues around documentation and their identities as well, which culminates in one of our favorite projects, which is a cell phone film festival, where students create films shot entirely on a mobile device and we do a, a little film fest around the movies that students uh, create. Uh, we think about the cultural impact of access and access to technology. We'll look at uh, things uh, such as the digital divide uh, with those who have access to technology and the internet and those who do not and how that might perpetuate power inequality both globally and within the United States. One of the projects we do here is I give students a scenario where we say here is a community that does not have access to um, broadband internet and abundant technology and it's impacting issues of education and access you have 45 minutes to design a solution. What is it going to be? And this is called our uh, Digital Divide Design Challenge. And we um, have, have winners walk away from that every year, coming up with just really innovative, interesting solutions to the digital divide. Um, and then we wrap up uh, by looking at creativity. And for DCC, Many people come into the program having some kind of arts background, whether it be in theater or music or, or dance um, or the fine arts or digital arts. Um, not all of our students have that though. Uh, and we actually push back against the idea that to be creative, you have to be an artist. Instead, we think of creativity as um, a habit. Uh, it's something we develop. It's, we, we build a method for being more creative human beings. Uh, and it's something you can actually build into. So we don't really buy into the notion of being tied to inspiration. Um, instead, it's really about hard work and, and habits that build up your creativity. And, and we think of creativity tying into every single major that all of you are interested in. Every major in some capacity must incorporate creativity into the work that you do in order to problem solve, in order to innovate, in order to do new and interesting things. Creativity is essential in all fields. Uh, so we talk about how do we do this? How do you actually methodologically think about what it means to be creative rather than just being like, that's a good idea. I'm going to come up with this fantastic new song I'm going to write, you know, and it just comes to you like that. Instead, what are some methods you can employ uh, to be more creative? Um, so I wanted to, so that's the first course. And then uh, we head through all these topics. We explore them. We explore them through hands-on methods. Um, from there, you will um, go into uh, the spring semester class of your freshman year. So it's one class per semester, essentially. Uh, where in the first year you're doing 105, which is that intro course with me. It's the one time that all freshmen are together. Uh, in the spring, you'll take 106. Uh, and from here on out, from, the, from 106 on, every class is a small seminar capped at no more than 15 students. Um, the idea is to keep these really small, as small as possible. Uh, and 106 is an ideas course. It fulfills humanities gen ed requirement. Uh, so it's about ideas. Uh, taking like a topic that we study in 105, for example, and then let's, which is a survey. 105 is just like all the things we're interested in. 106 is instead like now let's do a deep dive. Let's pick a topic and just sit with it all semester long. In the sophomore year, um, in the fall, you, you do two classes, a 201, which is just a one credit course for you to write a proposal for your capstone, which is the last thing you do in DCC. Uh, so in the fall, you come up with an idea for your capstone project. Uh, you also pair that with a 208 course, which fulfills your scholarship and practice general education requirement. Um, and 208 is about, okay, we studied this idea, now let's explore it through hands-on making. Uh, so 208 is a hands-on course. And then finally, the last course you take in the sequence for DCC is 209, which is your uh, capstone course, where you spend the whole semester just making. You have a whole semester to just build the project that you want to build. And you can do that in teams. Uh, you can make an individual capstone. Uh, it's up to you. Um, so in addition to those credits, uh, which f really fit into your gen ed, so it's not like you're taking DCC on top of your major, you're actually taking courses in DCC that you would have taken otherwise uh, elsewhere in the university. Um, but ultimately then you have three additional credits that you have to fulfill. Uh, these can be done through study abroad. 
which has been challenging lately. Hopefully when you join us, it won't be. Um, through internships, uh, you can take an uh, internship out in the world um, and then uh, do an internship course uh, and have those three credits apply to DCC. Or you can do an independent study with one of the faculty in DCC. I'm doing three independent studies right now. I did uh, two last semester where it's just one on one with with a faculty member and we sort of dig into an idea that you're really interested in or in a project that you want to uh, explore. Um, so like last semester, for example, um, I had a student who wanted to uh, spend the semester coming up with a, um, a script for a film he's currently working on is his capstone and he was doing some preparation on that. And so we are working through ideas around uh, futurity, around AI and those kinds of issues and also uh, issues around storytelling and good narrative and good script building. So we spent the whole semester just doing that. Uh, and then I also worked with another student on VR. His capstone project is going to be a VR game that he's designing. And uh, we just dug into topics around VR and sort of the, the state of the field and where it's going, as well as he taught himself Unity um, and worked in Blender to kind of teach him these tools that he needed to build an interesting VR interaction uh, for the future. Um, so some of the courses that you will take in 106 and 208 are, are kind of really um, broad in terms of the scope of them. We, we do things like sound cultures. Um, we have uh, had courses like um, history of the book, critical data modeling, digital storytelling, digital feminism, um, prototyping, internet of evil, religious discourse in the digital age. Um, and yeah, just kind of a wide range of, of topics that you can study in these courses. And they kind of change every year. We pull in different faculty from across campus to teach for us and to uh, come and bring their topics to us. Um, and so we have interactions with different departments across uh, the university. Within DCC, there's like this formal learning environment, but there's also a ton of activities that support that as a community. Some of these activities are kind of curricular in nature where we're teaching you things. We do uh, design camps uh, where we have alumni and we also have, we work with Adobe on these. So Adobe comes in and teaches um, uh, their software with us. We had two design camps this past fall, one on uh, Adobe um, Premiere and Rush and video editing and another one on Spark and, and social media. So Adobe comes and works with us. And then we also have alumni come and teach kind of a wide range of things, um, such as, for example, I just grabbed a poster from uh, design camps in 2020. Uh, so we'll do things like CAD and 3D printing, uh, creating generative art using the software called Processing. Uh, we did uh, self-portraits in Adobe Illustrator. We did do digital storytelling with Twine, uh, video editing, audio editing, uh, origami, uh, Tinkercad. Um, and a lot of these are held in our makerspace here in Prince Frederick Hall. And the makerspace has 3D printers, um, and but also like canvases for you to paint and you can work with felt we have a sewing machine we have a large format printer to print posters and it's kind of a we have a vr uh, a couple of vr headsets and a machine for that um, so we do kind of a range of hands-on activities uh, like we did a mobile app prototyping project uh, we have a sound studio where you can go and learn things like music composition or we'll have jam nights in the sound studio uh, for people to just bring their instruments and play and write music together uh, we've done things like book binding um, We've done intro to programming for students who have no programming background but are interested in it. We've done 3D modeling and printing, and of course, video editing, Illustrator. Uh, we've had projects where students learned how to make stained glass windows using soldering techniques. Um, we've done user interface prototyping. We've had groups around VR. So it's kind of just this wide range of things, and it really changes from year to year based on uh, what the students want to explore. Uh, every new cohort brings their own interests to the program and we shape the program around that cohort. Um, we also, um, ha our students are really competitive for internships. Uh, so the university has so many interesting, fantastic ways to get students to interface with um, 
different companies through career fairs and things like that. And our students stand out and get some of the best internships at the university because uh, they are interdisciplinary thinkers. Um, when I'm talking to businesses out in the world, what they say is what they're looking for are not necessarily students with hard skills, but the soft skills that aren't necessarily taught in the in the classroom. Because um, when I'm talking to some of these businesses, they're like, I'll teach you what you need to know on the job. Come and work for me. I'll teach you how to do this particular thing. But I can't teach you how to think in these kinds of dynamic ways. I can't teach you how to synthesize totally disparate fields of study. Um, I can't teach you the sort of the value of working with communities and thinking about cultural histories um, and how culture impacts this thing that we're doing. It's just too much for, for me to be able to do on the job. I can teach you how to code in Python here, this particular thing, uh, but I can't teach you those skills. And when DCC students apply for these, they are demonstrating that they are particular kinds of thinkers. Um, and they're really competitive for jobs um, and for internships. And these are some of the places that they've interned. Um, so our students go on to really do dynamic, really interesting things. Uh, this is Alicia Lowe. Um, Alicia was, um, when she was a freshman in the program, and we went through the Digital Divide Design Challenge and started talking about issues of access and, and technological equity. This really stuck out to her. And she decided to pursue this throughout the rest of her time at the University of Maryland and ultimately went on to Harvard Law School where she did her degree um, around tech policy. And that's what she's doing now. She's actually out in the world working in tech policy um, because of you know, the ways that DCC brought up these topics for her. Uh, another alum of ours is uh, Lily Bell Davis. Uh, she was an economics major uh, when she was here. In her right after her freshman year, she interned um, at Google, working with social media at Google. Uh, in her sophomore year, uh, she went on to continue to work at Google um, as an intern. When she applied, she actually had just no skill sets to initially. Like she's like, I don't really fit in with all of the things that Google wants me to do. So what she did was she started going around the hallway asking other DCCers, teach me how to do this thing. I want to know how to do this thing. And she taught herself in the hallways of DCC all the things she needed to make herself competitive to get um, into the Google internships. Uh, from there, she went on to study for a semester abroad at the London School of Economics. Um, and then she went on to do her law degree as well at Columbia University. Um, and a lot of these are just generated out of the communities that are built within the um, halls of DCC here in Prince Frederick Hall. Students also are competitive for internships because by the time you're done with your sophomore year, you have built a large scale project. And that sets you apart from your peers uh, in so many important ways. Uh, and I wanted to highlight a couple of capstone projects that demonstrate sort of the things that we valued. We Every year we have a capstone awards ceremony. Um, this is a picture from uh, a recent one where uh, we highlight and award sort of top four capstone projects. Uh, one of those um, a few years ago was uh, Divya and Kelly's webcomic uh, called Pixel. Um, and they are... Um, computer science majors and uh, wanted to explore, um, you know, th thinking about how to get girls, especially young students of color, young women of color into STEM fields, especially computer science. How can we draw them into this? And so they decided to create this character named Pixel and Pixel had the superpower where when she coded things, they appeared in real life. And so it was a way to kind of create, um, to show code on the, on the page and, and show how this thing was created using code, uh, get people attracted to it, familiar with it, and also kind of show um, a young woman of color with this superpower that's built around um, uh, coding and computer science. Uh, another one that I like to highlight, which is kind of several years old, I just kind of always love to point back to it, uh, is Ben Graney Green, who is an aerospace engineer, but also a musician. And he wanted to build something that married those two things together. He built this thing called Soundware, which has these speakers, and it also has microphones kind of sticking out the back of it. And what it was is kind of this 
uh, filter for the sounds around you. It takes the sounds that are immediately around you and then captures them, feeds them through the computer and filters them in these really sonic, interesting ways. He went on to display this at various arts festivals and um, got all kinds of uh, uh, amazing grants to be able to uh, showcase this work at different arts festivals, which is fantastic. He's a he's an aerospace engineer, but he's doing art festivals, and that's kind of the epitome of what a DCC student really is. Um, Galia was a, a neuroscience major, a psychology minor, and um, she was also an artist. And so she built her own EEG, EEG machine, and um, through the brain waves that she captured from people, that turned they. It, it turned those brain waves into generative art. Um, Tyla Holloman, um, a couple of years ago, produced something called uh, Race Cards, which is a game about microaggressions and institutional racism. Uh, Tyla is a chemical engineering major. She graduated uh, and she has now in a PhD program in chemical engineering, but she wanted to create a game that explored issues of race and microaggressions and their impact. Um, and another component of her project was also an art installation piece as well. Um, so Emily, uh, Anaya, and Angela created uh, a project, this is from last year, uh, one of our winning pieces, that explored sustainability in fashion. So it was kind of a critique of fast fashion, of just this fashion that we buy, it only lasts for a year and you throw it away. Um, so they're trying to upcycle uh, clothing and it's a project about how to cr you know, combine arts and uh, fashion and sustainability to create a project that ultimately um, points people toward ways of sustainable interaction uh, with clothing. Uh, Priya and Maya created um, a series of audio interviews um, and uh, a website around issues um, uh, related to students' experiences with discrimination. Uh, and they used Adobe products for this and ultimately Adobe awarded them a capstone award out of this project as well. Uh, and then we also had a new uh, set of awards this, this year, one of them being the Adobe one, and then we did another DCC uh, capstone award around racial justice, and that was given to um, Chisholm, who created this really interesting 3D interactive piece um, that explored um, the movie or the film Get Out and the issues of race around it and got students to just interact with it in uh, really dynamic and interesting ways that, that tied into all of the ways that to, to read the film. Um, we also had a uh, magazine produced by Madeline Harris as a larger research project. She started it uh, around issues of black grief. And this is an ongoing research project that she's working on in her major. It will be her capstone project within her major as well as she continues to have it grow. Um, so what kind of student ultimately succeeds in DCC? Um, really, it comes down in my mind to really curious individuals with many interests. Um, that's one of the main things. You just have to be curious. You have to um, really want to explore things that are outside of your wheelhouse. You want to connect the dots across uh, institutions. Um, the thing that I always say, and, it, and it's totally accurate because just year after year, students nod when I say this, like a DCC student, if they could major in 10 things, they would major in 10 things. Um, like the fact that you have to major in one thing is kind of a drag for DCC students because they want to do it all. Uh, there's so many different interests, you know. Um, you know, we've got students who are double majoring right now in public policy and cinema and media studies, you know, and, and chatting with her about this. She's like, I don't know how they interact. I don't know how public policy and cinema uh, interact, but I just love these two things and I'm gonna explore them and they're gonna be my double major. Um, so really just curious students. Um, you know, if you are a student who's like, you know, I love coding, I wanna go into computer science, uh, I wanna be um, a software engineer when I graduate and I kind of hate everything else besides that. I don't really want to study anything else except computer science, but we're definitely not the program for you. Um, you know, if you are like, I'm a business major, 
I just want to go into business. I want to, to make my own business and, and really like to go and do that other course in like women, gender and sexuality studies sounds so boring to me. I just, I uh, hate that I have to do that. We are not the right program for you. You know, it's instead students who are like flipping through the course offerings and are like, oh, this sounds interesting. This sounds interesting. I don't know how to decide between any of these things. Students who are just curious, many interests, um, who really love to think across different areas of study. Um, students who are creative um, or want to expand their creativity uh, really do well in the program. That's kind of a thing we're looking for in the admissions process is what kinds of hands-on work have you done in some kind of arts in the past. Uh, you don't have to be an artist, but did you do crew for theater? You know, um, were you in orchestra or dance, or do you write your own music? Um, you know, in some way, do you have some kind of hands-on connection to a creative endeavor? Um, that's really one of the baseline things that we look for um, in the admissions process. Um, students who come in to our program need to value diversity, uh, diversity of ideas, of cultural backgrounds, and val like that's essential to you. You want to be surrounded by a diverse group of people. That's where you're going to thrive and do your best work. Um, and really, ultimately, the kind of DCC student who thrives in our program is one who realizes that education is not purely just about the academics in the classroom. It's not just about job preparation. It's about transforming who you are as a human being. Um, and it's vital that you end up in a place that fosters that and allows you to thrive. And that's ultimately what these chats are about is to be able to say, this is the space where I'm going to thrive as a human being, where I'm going to grow. I'm going to find my community. And these people are going to be my lifelong friends and going to support me throughout that first hard year of college. Um, this is my community. This is where I'm going to do my best work. Um, so the students in DCC really value that. They value that this is a community, that this is a, a support system for them. These are their, their lifelong friendships. Um, and so um, as you are thinking about preferencing us, um, really you will get a chance to kind of write a sentence or so about uh, the programs that you decide to preference. So it is really important for us. We look at those and, and we try to see that you've done your homework about DCC, that you know the kind of program we are, um, that you kind of identify the kinds of things you're bringing to the program uh, that really helps set you apart in the application process uh, to, to demonstrate a fit with the program. Um, we have in many years just had hundreds more applications into DCC than we can possibly uh, offer invitations to. So we are really particular about the kind of student that joins DCC. And, and uh, this has just worked out really well. What, what ends up happening is you've just got in this building in Prince Frederick Hall, just a really good set of human beings, just such wonderful people to be around. Um, I love just surrounding myself with DCC students um, and, and it's just this fantastic community. Um, so this is Prince Frederick Hall where you would live if you join us. Um, and it is really a space that develops the conditions for outside of the box thinking, for seeing the world differently, of really understanding ways to change the world and create solutions to some of our big problems. Um, we foster a small college feel on a large research campus. So you walk in the door on day one and you've got a group of people you already know uh, that you're connected to, but you've also got this massive research institution that has so many resources. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. It's a small college experience with all of the resources of a large research campus. Um, but by and large, the number one thing that students will say, regardless of what we study in DCC, is that it is just a really great community. Um, it's a place where you will be at home. Um, you'll just kind of love to be in Prince Frederick Hall around these students. Uh, and that's really the, the big takeaway. Um, kind of regardless of the things that I teach you in 105, you walk away after your time in DCC uh, with a community and that community stays with you. Um, all four years at the university, students will 
um, typically live with each other um, all four years. The first two years you live in Prince Frederick, but the students will often move right across the street from the building into the common apartments uh, that are right there. So we have kind of this community of folks that are just right in this uh, part of campus here. Uh, and we keep in touch with our alumni uh, throughout their time after they graduate. Um, and it is, it is this amazing community. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up there and um, please visit our website. Uh, if you have any questions, my email is on there. Jessica Liu is our associate director. Um, she is also able to answer questions that you have as well. And we've got plenty of time here to uh, do some Q&A um, and any sort of questions uh, you have. Um, okay, so... Um, and I haven't been able to monitor the chat. So uh, Christina, Bryant, uh, Timmy, anything from the chat that's emerged? I think we've got all of it under control. Okay, nice. Anything. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, and would you all mind introducing yourselves? Um, um, maybe starting uh, with Christina, do you mind introducing Yeah, I'm already yourself? unmuted. It's all right. All right, oh, great. so... Perfect. Hi everyone, I'm Christina. I was from the Kappa class of BCC. So if you're unaware, we name all of our classes after the Greek alphabet. So I'm currently a junior. I graduated from BCC last year. And since then I've been involving myself in the program. I was Jason's TA at 105 last semester and I genuinely just love the program. So that's why I'm here. Great, thank you. All right, uh, Bryant, yeah. Sure. Uh, my name is Brian. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm part of the MU class, also the freshman class that just came here. So this is my second semester with BCC. I'm a middle school math and science education major, so you can really be from any major. And yeah, BCC is absolutely amazing. Awesome. Thank you. Tim Taupe. Hi, my name is Temi Tepa. I'm a senior uh, mechanical engineering major. I was in this. I'm an alumna uh, at BCC and honestly loved it here. So... I have all that experiences. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, so if you have questions, um, you can drop them uh, into the chat. You can also unmute yourself uh, if you like and and uh, ask through audio as well. So how does the admissions work for this? Yeah, um, so, and maybe I'll pass that over to, to Jenny or Chantel to sort of talk generally about the admissions process, and then I can talk about DCC in particular. Does that work, Jenny? Yeah, sorry. My internet's slow. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, he, he just asked, uh, how does the admissions process work? Um, from this point forward for yes, preferencing? Yeah. Or? Yes, for okay. preferencing, yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, so students have until February 21st to submit their preference forms. Our programs will review those um, and finalize the invites. Um, and the decisions are primarily going to be based, as uh, Dr. Foreman said, on you know what you are writing in um, the form about what why you're interested in each program, um, and on our spaces in each program. Uh, there's definitely um, limits on some on space in, in every single program and some programs are bigger than others and have more space but um, we will make sure that we have a spot for every single student who submits a form by February 21st on or before February 21st to be clear um, and then we'll send those invites so you will know that information you will know which living learning program you're invited to um, within the first couple of weeks of March. Um, and then students still have until May 1st to let us know whether they want to enroll at UMD. So submitting the preference form doesn't commit you to anything. Um, it just means that you will get the information about your LLP invite um, on or before um, before you have to, sorry, before you have to make a decision. It does not matter when you submit the preference form. Everyone who submits by February 21st will be considered. And well, sorry, everyone who submits by February 21st will have a space. Yeah. Um, and it's it's sort of, it's a rolling process. We're not finalizing any decisions until after February 21st. Right. So um, you have until February 21st, although I do recommend submitting a little earlier, just in case you have any technical problems, it makes it easier for us to solve those issues. Um, that is, is sorry, um, is that for all programs? Could you be more specific? 
and maybe that applies they, to the question I, above that is not admissions right. related. Um, yeah, and, and in terms of DCC, um, most of the students we invite, so we try to bring in a cohort uh, between 60 and 65 students um, to, to join us. Most of the students who get an invitation from DCC end up preferencing us first uh, as their first preference. Not everybody, though. Um, we will have a student who preferences ILS or uh, Integrated Life Sciences, for example, first. Um, maybe they didn't get the AP scores or whatever for ILS. Um, and didn't get into the ILS program, which is kind of a pre-med thing. And then we are their number two. And we look at their application and we dig into every single application deeply. And we're like, this person's a DCC student. They preferenced ILS, but they didn't know it. They're going to be so much happier in DCC. So sometimes we will take a number two, a student who ranks a second, because we know actually better that they, they preference that thing. Uh, they're going to be better in DCC just based on the kind of student they are, their values, their background, you know, everything like that. Um, so, um, and again, highlighting the kinds of um, arts practice and arts very broadly uh, conceived uh, helps uh, because we want students to come into the program with some kind of um, hands on skill set that they're bringing to it um, and again that doesn't need to not every student has that but um, i would say the majority of students in some capacity engage the arts um, or music or you know some some kind of hands-on work that they like to do um, and kind of addressing that helps a bit as well so the honors colleges will read my undergraduate application in addition to like my preferences and a, a right. sentence about why that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So I look at, um, so let's say, Liam, that you are um, preferencing DCC first. It'll give you a space to be able to say why. You know, why did you choose DCC first? I'll read that. You'll show up in sort of my admission system. I'll say, Liam, this is why he's interested in DCC, why he chose it first. Then I open your UMD undergraduate application. I've got everything there. I've got your essay. I've got everything about you, your resume. I know what kinds of uh, activities you were a part of uh, in undergrad, uh, or sorry, in uh, high school as you join undergrad. Um, so I get sort of the full picture of that for you as well. And so, and then I take sort of copious notes about your application and about why you chose DCC. I pass this along to my uh, associate director, Jessica. She looks it over. We compare notes and just like, yes, like this is a DCC student, admit, you know, or um, my favorite, my favorite kind of application to come across is like, I want to join DCC because I want to live in Prince Frederick Hall. And then we could say, no, <laughs> uh, we will not give you admission because you want to live in a great dorm. That's not a good enough reason to join DCC, uh, even though D Prince Frederick Hall is the best dorm on campus. Um, every year we have a student who wants to join DCC simply because of the dorm and that doesn't work for us. So. So I have a lot of general education uh, transfer credits. So will the DCC courses still be able to be beneficial to me? Am I still allowed to take them even if they yeah. don't really count? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, w the University of Maryland has some sort of odd um gen ed things uh that dcc helps fulfill things like scholarship and practice which um don't always come from high school uh, ap kinds of courses um the other thing is a, what's called i series uh which are uh 105 classes just um been approved for so the the i series is like big ideas you know like take a course that explores a big concept and, and ours is design you know like how does design impact uh human interaction um so it will we will still help fulfill gen ed stuff even if you might have bring in like a humanities gen ed from high school or something along those lines you can still take that humanities class with us um and uh, you can just take a bunch of humanities gen ed courses at the university if they interest you. Um, there's no restriction on that. It's just you have to kind of meet a minimum requirement for the university. Um, 
A good question from Emily. Uh, does changing the major I put on my undergraduate application in MEC affect the admissions process to this or any other program? For us, it does not, and I don't think it does for any of the LLPs. Uh, honestly, I would say every LLP wants a wide range of majors uh, represented in the program. Um, there are times when a student's major kind of supports the kind of work that they want to do. Um, the university uh, recently launched a program called Immersive Media Design. And so it's obvious that a student who's majoring in immersive media design is interested in design and technology and will probably fit well. Um, but like Tyla's work as a chemical engineering major, you know, um, fits so well with what we do. And, and so we don't judge people based on their majors because a DCC major is like Ben Grainy Green as well, like the the student who's aerospace, an aerospace musician, you know, um, or somebody who's a computer scientist and theater person, or, uh, you know, it's, so the major doesn't really sum up DCC students. We're really, um, you know, we have a bunch of STEM majors in the program. Um, we are kind of at the moment, a little bit majority STEM majors within the program, but all the students are, uh, by and large, sort of driven by creative pursuits in, in one way or another. Does DCC or any of the other honors colleges uh, make it easier to get internships? Um, that's a good question. Um, and I think being in the honors college um, sort of by and large helps with this. Uh, it does set you apart. Um, programs that have a capstone, from my experience anyway, pro programs that have a capstone project by the time you're a sophomore really do help with uh, the process because you carry that capstone project with you into interviews um, and very few sophomores have that capacity uh, to do so. So I think looking for a program that gives you the opportunity to build a large scale project early on in your career at the University of Maryland does help you stand out. That's that's my estimation of the experience. In programs like Gemstone, you're in a research team um, and you're working on a project. That's really fantastic as well in terms of um, going out into um, interviews for internships and say, I'm working with a team. We're working on this project. We're kind of digging into this thing uh, as well. So uh, it's just different approaches to it. Gemstone being a four-year program where you don't actually walk out with the final product until you're a senior. Um, but nonetheless, the kinds of work that you're doing there uh, can help uh, can help you stand out. Um, so yeah, I think that 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 helps a lot. And really, it is the kind of internship you want to take on, um, especially if it doesn't perfectly dovetail with your major. Um, DCC can help augment that as well, or or the kind of program that you want to take on if if you are a computer science major, but you want to work for like a cultural institution that supports social justice. Maybe being an honors humanities helps sort of augment uh, the computer science major in, in that sense. Um, so those are just my general observations from working with the students over the last decade anyway. Uh, good question from Allie. Uh, have students been able to put their capstone projects into real world practice uh, within the broader UMD campus uh, or beyond? Absolutely. Um, so you have a lot of students who want to carry on their projects sort of out into the world and continue to, to build them out across a period of time. So I think that there's a couple of um, approaches to this that DCC students have. Um, one is a very common one where they build the capstone and you build it in a semester. It's kind of a seedling of a project. And then when you get into the junior year, you are just swamped with work. You know, you're, you dive into your major and you are really doing uh, upper division courses within your major and the DCC capstone kind of becomes a thing you did in the sophomore year and there's little time to work on it. Um, and then the other end of things are students who the DCC capstone represents the things that they are ultimately really passionate about and they want to carry them on um, and work with different um, organizations to find that. So we will help support capstone projects that go on beyond the sophomore year, both financially, but also tying people into different uh, faculty resources or different community resources to continue to build out the capstone if that's a project you want to continue to work on. Um, some of these projects become 
small businesses for students. Uh, we've had a student, we've had students who are interested in, um, you know, issues around uh, sort of the intersection of, of design, community and health and food, and they uh, build their own kind of pop-up food store, you know, that addresses issues that they're interested in. And these become actually careers for them uh, that they're working in. We have students who are interested in sustainable architecture and their capstone project ultimately becomes something they work in uh, to their architecture degree and uh, or a sustainability minor on campus. And that's something that they continue to just work on and build out. Um, and there's lots of resources for that. Um, so yeah, there's there's a ton of examples of this in kind of a wide range of fields of students continuing to find real world applications for these. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, thanks, Christina, for bringing up uh, Ayelet's uh, project as well, which is radically changing campus food access for uh, Jewish students on campus and kosher students. Uh, so um, her capstone is changing uh, what it means to dine on campus if you're an observant student. All right, any other questions that you all have? Okay, uh, one of the last things that I mentioned is that um, during recruitment, I'm more interested in making sure that you land in the right program than trying to get you into DCC. Because for me, the worst thing is when you try to join DCC, but it just ends up not being a great fit for you. I would rather you just be able to join the program that you just will fit well with. And I'm happy to serve as kind of a um, a sounding board um, at any point. Do feel free to kind of bounce questions my way via email. We can set up a time to chat on Zoom or by phone. Um, I'm here to just bounce around ideas and, and let you know, is DCC really the best program for you? Uh, how does it compare to other living learning programs on campus? Um, and just try to to gauge whether or not this is gonna be uh, the right home for you at the University of Maryland or at the University of Maryland broadly is the best space for you as well. Um, I'm happy to be as objective a uh, sounding board as I can possibly be. I'm more interested in you finding a place where you're gonna thrive and, and, and become your best self than say, gotta recruit into DCC. Um, so do feel free to touch base at any point. I have a question for the students. Um, for the community, how did you guys feel like your freshman year? Was it actually something where you were just like, wow, I'm actually making some good friends and stuff, or am I just like, was it kind of difficult to actually bring in that community? Uh, yeah, sorry, I I to oh, never mind. Please, please go. <laughs> Are you sure? Yes, okay. I'm positive. It's just so hard to tell over the scene. Um, so it was very easy to make friends at DCC. I remember my freshman year, um, everyone would have their doors open in their dorms. And so basically everyone's like pop in and like you make new friends. And then uh, your paired, your roommate's going to be someone who's also in DCC. So then you, always, you already have something in common. Um, like I said earlier, I'm a senior and I can tell you now, a lot of my friends to this day are friends that I met from DCC. Uh, we have a yearly, now that everyone's kind of like moved out and doing their own thing, we have a yearly meeting because of how Jason did the DCC in DC. We continue to do that <laughs> in our own time. And I love, I love it every single year. It's something I look forward to. So I would definitely say the community is so easy and I love it. Yeah. I'll add on to that and say that um, if you remember during the presentation, Jason mentioned that two Capstone Award winners, Sophia and Maya, they're my roommates. They're literally chatting up a storm right now in our living room and I can hear them. So yeah, I think it's something that DCC um, always say that DCC people can become, become their roommates, like you live with them throughout college and it's definitely true. I have to be the bringer of bad news here and say that our year killed the keeping your dorm 
doors open trend. I'm so sorry. We tried, it really didn't work out. But um, I definitely stayed in the lounge a lot. We have nice, great, huge lounges in Prince Frederick. And if you just sat there and did your homework, people would come, you chat, and suddenly you're friends with everyone you're bored. It's really great in that way. See, even though you killed it, Christina, I brought it back because even during the pandemic, it was still super easy to make friends, which is super shocking. Like I still kept my door open that first week of moving in. People were kind of just coming in and out of our bedroom. We were all just talking. It's really easy to find a community here. You just make friends immediately because at the very least, you have one thing in common. That is DCC. And yeah, it's really great. And Brian, do you want to answer this question that's in the chat too, in terms of social events? So Brian is a part of our DCC Student Council, uh, and they are part of planning events and whatnot. ACES lives in the building, and we'll have two other programs. Um, or sorry, we'll have one other program in Prince Frederick with us, uh, which is be the new um, honors business program. Um, but in terms of like events in the building that, that get students to interact, do you want to chat about that? Sure, just within the building itself. Sometimes we get to work with all the RAs in the building and sometimes we'll help them plan whole building events. For example, they often hold movie nights, trivia nights. Those are two main events that they try to do last year. Um, another big thing that Prince Frederick is known for is that we kind of have these sticky note art on our huge windows and every year the theme changes. So the theme for this year was Avatar. So every floor has a different character and that's a great bonding experience because each one person is always designated to do it, but everyone in the building kind of works together. Nice, that's great. Um, yeah, so there are honors uh, specific activities that students uh, can bridge across. Uh, we'll sometimes partner with just a particular uh, LLP and, and do some kind of event with them. Uh, so we do try to get you to to interact with the other LLPs uh, throughout the year as well. So DCC has 47 different majors. Uh, what, how many majors do the other living learning programs have? Are there any that are focused on just a couple or is it pretty broad anyways? Yeah, that, that I don't know the answer to. Um, I know the Honors College kind of broadly is interdisciplinary. I think um, some, programs like ACES, for example, do tend to attract uh, computer scientists and students who are interested, obviously, in cybersecurity and doing hands-on work uh, with that. So um, majors that are more centered on that, perhaps. Um, but I'm not totally sure, to be honest. I don't know what their statistics are. Um, Jenny, or I don't know if, if... No, I was going to say you'd have to t attend the other chats to find out. Yeah. <laughs> They may not have that specific stat, but every program welcomes students of all majors. Um, as Dr. Furman said, the ACES is going to be, you know, cybersecurity heavy. ILS, the Integrated Life Sciences, is going to be biology and life sciences heavy. Um, Honors Humanities has um, a lot of arts and humanities students, but certainly um, STEM students from across the campus. Um, UH is probably the most broad because it is very uh, multidisciplinary in and of itself, the, the whole topic of it. Um, but yeah, you'd have to ask the other programs those specific information. So I guess we'll be seeing you, Liam, first of all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think that's time. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, if you have any um, additional questions that are DCC specific, feel free to um, first um, check out their website. They have a lot of information already on there. Um, I'll put it back in the chat, dcc.umd.edu. It also has Jason and Jessica's information on there if you need to contact them directly to ask any specific questions. If you have any just general honors related questions, feel free to um, to email us at honors admissions at, thank you, Jenny, honors admissions at umd.edu. Um, I just want to say thank you to our students who have joined us, our current students, for um, answering these questions. Um, and then our prospective students, thank you so much for joining us um, for tonight. We 